We've got um, one new person here, uh, Michelle. We usually ask folks who are new to give uh, a quick introduction. I was wondering if you'd be open to doing that. Sure. Oh, let me get the. I have to put a like a post-it note on my camera because it doesn't shut off. <laughs> so okay, uh, <laughs> that was my pink post-it note. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. Yes, my name is Michelle Moy. I just recently graduated from Valdosta State University uh, in MLIS. I graduated first off in 95, but I got my MLIS degree this past 2019. And uh, I'm working at Valdosta State University as a assistant librarian, a library assistant, got to get it right, library assistant uh, in cataloging and um, I'm a copy cataloger for the government documents here and I uh, get everything from the GPO. And um, I'm just new to, um, I want to be a metadata librarian one day if I can get a position that will <clears throat> benefit me and everybody else. And uh, but right now I'm more interested into anything digital library as far as that's concerned so I'm trying to find my little what my supervisor called my place and my little niche <laughs> if that helps <laughs> and I'm from Valdosta Georgia welcome all right well thanks for the intro yeah welcome um so uh, today, uh, we've got uh, a more open agenda um, than we normally do, uh, and I, I, you know, I think uh, perhaps next time we'll be having another speaker, but we've had multiple speakers so far this year, uh, but this time we actually wanted to try a format where uh, we are doing something that's it's a little bit similar to, um, I don't know if folks have seen the, uh, the call for proposals from uh, the NDSA DigiPres or Digital Preservation Conference um, that's happening later this year. But uh, one of the formats that you can propose, and I think that this, the call for proposals actually ends today. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the formats is something called a solution room where you can take a half an hour and um, actually propose a topic and uh, engage folks in discussion about uh, what type of solution might be uh, appropriate for that particular challenge or issue that's coming up um, in the room. And so we, we thought we uh, would try something similar um, to that for at least one of our discussions here in the infrastructure interest group um, to see if people had, you know, particular challenges or issues that have been coming up, um, you know, at their institution. Uh, that we might all be able to brainstorm some, you know, some next steps for, uh, or might be able to lend our own experiences towards, um, see if we could uh, help out in any way. So, um, Leah, is there, is there anything you wanted to, to add to that kind of framing or? No, that's pretty much the way I was looking at it as well. Just, um, you know, open discussion about problems and solutions that somebody might have come up with in their own institution that might help. So, yeah. All right, so I, I put down a couple of ideas here, but um, I was hoping that uh, other folks might um, be open to putting their, any other um, ideas that they had uh, kind of like adding to the list there. Um, these are the ones that I put down are, uh, I don't know, they're, they're somewhat broad, and, and I'm I'm really curious to see whether or not folks have other folks have kind of uh, run up against these types of things, um, or if they have interest in them. Um, but just to instead of jumping into those right away, um, I wanted to open it up and see if anybody had anything that they wanted to uh, to discuss uh, um, to get us started. Hi, um, I have a topic that I kind of wanted to pitch for the group. Um, my name is Nora Egloff. I'm the digital repository librarian at Lafayette College. And I haven't come to this group for a couple of, you know, for so many months, I would say. I was something, you know, I 
had previously come pretty regularly and then I dropped off for a bit um, in the plague year. But um, something that I, I would love to hear from folks about is about um, setting up services, if anyone has worked on this, which I suspect you may have, um, just we're a smaller institution and we're getting a lot of requests for, and there's a real need for um, making different kinds of faculty data sets um, into a work type that our inter institutional repository can service, um, you know, particularly for um, data that is supported, you know, by, you know, supporting a grant and it's a part of their DMP and that's not something that we currently do. Um, and at the same time that we are exploring adding this service um, and what would be needed for it, you know, we've also received this directive that, um, you know, all the compute and storage for library services needs to move to AWS this summer. So we're kind of trying to combine those two, um, you know, to try to work on both of those at the same time and think about how they can inform each other. And um, so I realize that's a very broad thing, uh, you know, providing, you know, services for different faculty research data sets in an institutional repository, but I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts about uh, or experiences with setting that up at their institutions. Um, Well, I can I can say um, you know off the bat we we uh, so so uh, I'm at uh, California Digital Library um, so actually so is Terry uh, Brady and so one of the things that started to happen um, but before both of us got there um, was uh, a joint venture into storing data sets uh, with Dryad and um, you know it's a general it's a generalist. A repository for data sets that yeah that I'm sure you're familiar with but it was it's just been really interesting actually working on the integration between uh, the repository that we have and their service um, and I, I think um, you know one of one of the benefits of working with another um, organization that's already been up and running for a while uh, is just to see that <clears throat> they already had like a whole curation workflow in place um, and they were they were saving they had everything up in s3 as well um, and then you know so that was serving as a place for all the data sets that eventually through this collaboration we wanted to put into our preservation repository and so so what did that mean because we were we were also storing things in s3 we, we store our library collections in s3 and um uh, you know, we have like the, the the preservation repository that we have is basically like doing all those typical things that you would think of in terms of like fixity checking and um, replication and all that sort of stuff. Um, but there's, you know, there's also the whole aspect of making sure that, uh, you know, the ability to, um, you know, assign like uh, an identifier or multiple identifiers to a particular data set and making sure that that is, is out there, uh, made available through uh, data site or another organization like that. Um, you know, all those aspects kind of play into it uh, or having a DOI assigned to a data set, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious, like there are so many different little details that work into it. I'm kind of curious about what's the most, what are the most important details to the, to to you right now, like what are what are those or to the to the folks who would actually be, I mean, I hear the the notion of a, a data management plan being very important, and then of course you know grants require those and all that sort of stuff, and and um, yeah, I'm just uh, like what are the like if you had to name like the top three most important like aspects of the solution, what what would those be? Um, probably compliance with the funder needs. So that would be these things being citable, having, having um, you know, we have handle minting. So that would probably be the permalink that they would use. Um, but, you know, 
I guess that's the most important and like able to be found, you know, search engine optimized, which our, which our repository does, but it's really, um, we have to ask for the services that we need to do this from our campus IT. Okay. And that communication of determining like what, what we can get and then being able to communicate that to our users is very challenging because it's almost like IT is provisioning all of these services for the whole campus, but they don't, you know, so they see the library as a client, but then like we have our sub clients that, that then that's who really, you know, the faculty are coming to us with these requests because we understand their, their kind of research pipeline um, and the office of sponsored research will come to the library, but then we're, we're sort of provisioning these research data services. Um, but then, you know, and IT is outside of those communications and maybe doesn't understand those needs as well, but they're the ones who really are holding the purse strings and who are negotiating those contracts with the cloud provider. So, um, yeah, so I guess I'm just kind of looking for, for ad advice from other institutions that have handled this successfully in the past. Um, you know, because I, I feel very much like, you know, a middleman um, between those two parties. Um, Nora, right. I can give you a little bit of information about what UVA is doing. We're using Dataverse for this purpose, and okay. we, have a, we have our ETDs and our open access items. And basically, uh, our that's Samvera based, that we're using Dataverse. And we have stood up our own, but you can also have a hosted option with Dataverse. And I don't know if we've moved ours into Amazon yet, but we have most of our stuff. But it sounds like it has a lot of the things that you're asking for. Okay. And, um, you know, the data is cited and the data management plan is connected and all those things. And Cherry Lake is the local contact at UVA and I know she'd be happy to talk to you about it. Well, thanks so much, Robin. Sure. That's what I was going to mention as well. Uh, Dataverse, as a law school, we don't have a lot of data sets, so we don't have sciences or anything like that. But we also use Dataverse. Okay. I guess the other thing I would add is we're using AP Trust for our preservation layer. And that is connected well. So um, we also have faculty that have their own Dataverse nodes. So that was a benefit because you can make a Dataverse network. So if you have faculty that have already gone out and got those, you can. Uh, connect them. Okay. Well, thanks, folks. So, I'm, I guess, um, yeah, one other question I might might have is. Uh, in terms of the the information, the data itself, are there is this is this, uh, basically something that you would be that most people would want their data sets to be openly accessible, or are they also some of them have um, you know sensitive information in them or a combination? Um, for the most part, right now, I haven't had any requests for data sets that would need to be anonymized um, or have any of those kinds of concerns. But I do think that that would have to be a part of our intake workflow. We'd have to build that out of asking those sorts of questions and you know, working with whoever was submitting this data. But most of it is right now that I've gotten requests for is either like GIS kind of data or um, like sensor data for different kinds of 
projects in the sciences, um, like astronomical sensor data and that kind of thing that would really, you know, probably just be very large zipped um, registries and, um, you know, directories of like just sensor data. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not as, um, no, I'm not that familiar with Dataverse. And I'm, I'm just uh, I'm wondering if it does provide for, uh, you know, this, the storage of sensitive information as well as, uh, as anything else, or if there's, a, if there's a, a secure pipeline, I guess maybe you could build between Dataverse and whatever the preservation layer is. Is, is that sort of thing available or? You, you can choose um, it, it can be configured so that you can have a secure storage as well as i don't want to say unsecured storage but you know what i mean right now lee do you have anything like that set up we're not actually storing highly sensitive data right now oh leah you're on mute yeah. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, we don't have very many data sets at this point and none of them are sensitive. Um, and again, being at a law school, we, we don't even really, we, we are part of a larger Dataverse, so we don't even really have our own Dataverse instance, but I know you can. I think there are lots of levels of granularity in Dataverse in terms of setting up security and, and setting up uh, Dataverses, <laughs> so we're we're part of Harvard's Dataverse. So, yeah. But it's fairly easy. One thing I can say is that it's fairly low barrier. So uh, that's that's a good thing. <laughs> it's not uh, overly complicated to get up and running. Is there anybody else who has other um, tools that they're using, whether they're home built or for data sets, or is it something that you're thinking about and um, you know are, have had discussions about just out of curiosity? Guess not. Okay. I'll unmute for a second. So it is something that we are thinking about. We did a trial of Dataverse at, at Berkeley, um, but didn't decide to turn that into a full fledged service. But I did have a follow up question for Nora because you had mentioned issues like interfacing with central campus IT. It sounded like that was a big pain point. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, you know, we have our maybe twice a year meetings with the um, digital infrastructure team on campus. And that's, you know, our main way of sort of asking for things and communicating needs. Um, and we don't have, you know, they're, they're very, you know, they're, they're the gatekeepers uh, and the decision makers when it comes to, um, you know, the services that we use with AWS. Um, and we've got, you know, meetings with them this summer about migrating all of the compute and storage for our institutional repository um, to AWS. So I'm sort of just trying to prepare for that um, and elaborate on, you know, specifically this need that we have for, you know, serving large data sets, um, you know, having a work type that might have files that are very large um, and seeing, you know, whether that's going to be possible um, and building out a work type in our IR for that. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, I, I feel like I need to create a lot of documentation to make them understand what we even need, like ahead of these meetings. Um, just because we we often talk past each other. Um. Yeah, my my experience has been that um, 
there is sometimes a belief that you can just focus on the technology and not actually know the way that it's used. And that's never actually been true. Like when we work with central campus IT now, we have, we have much more frequent meetings than we used to. Um, so for some teams that we interact with a lot, for instance, for storage and backup, we have a weekly or I'm sorry, a monthly standing meeting and it does take time, but it's helped to sort of spread the knowledge about what we do at the library so that when they come to us with solutions or they're looking at new backup software or like snapshotting tools and whatnot, it's not just completely out of the blue. Like they have a sense of how we would actually use that. So that's been helpful. And I guess my, my impression is if you're only meeting with them twice a year, that's probably not frequent enough. Yeah. What is your institutional repository built on? It is Samvira Hyrax. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I know that the, well, at least I don't, at this point, I'm not using uh, Samvira, but um, my understanding is that it, it has the capability to uh, handle data sets, but yeah. Uh, I also my also my understanding is that it's a pretty heavy li lift to build out that infrastructure to make that happen. So I think a lot probably I mean, I think you probably have to weigh the benefit of having a single institutional repository uh, where you can manage everything in the same place versus the IT uh, lift like i said heavy lift for for creating that that structure dan i see you nodding your head is that something that you are familiar with well just that any my view is that you it's more of an organizational design question i want to have a team that controls the stack from bottom to top as much as possible um but that's not always possible and it's especially not possible if you're dealing with a central campus it unit where you can't take someone's time you know, to just join your team for three months. Um, but I, I have found some success in just explaining that across units. Um, so it, it, it's kind of like building a bit of soft power, like you build relationships with effective, you know, team, like people on teams around the campus, and then you can kind of leverage them. Uh, so. Yeah, so some of the comes down to your environment for sure. Sorry, I cut somebody off there. <laughs> I was just gonna ask Noor, who is supporting the HIRAC stack that you have for your institution repository? Um, that would be myself and the one developer that we have in the library. So it is okay. the two of us, yep. yeah. <laughs> but, but that's on infrastructure with core IT? Um, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> I was just oh, asking. I know that Michigan has built out uh, research data on a Hyrax stack. But it sounds like you have limited resources, so you might not want to go that way. All right, well, thanks for your advice, everybody. I like, yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing up that. Um, and I, you know, the 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 other thing that comes to mind is, uh, and maybe it, this could be one more question. Um, when it comes to discoverability, is is it important for is 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 it important for these to be discoverable mainly like within like the library catalog, or just like literally, you know, uh, having a front end that's crawled by Google or otherwise or Um, well, it, it, it is crawled by Google, um, and I know that it is very important to, like, our faculty that they have their permalinks and they have, you know, they're able to sort of point to this in a durable way, um, like in their ORCID profiles, um, things of that nature. Um, but we don't, I don't believe that resources that are in our repository right now are 100% all, you know, 
separately as resources in the catalog um, discovery layer. Like there are definitely collections that are um, that have co catalog records, um, but I don't necessarily think that the data sets would um, individually. You know, it's more like a you know if it's a something from special collections that's been digitized, you know, it'll point to it in the catalog record kind of thing. But right, right, okay, interesting. Laura, I'm just going to post our main information site for uh, Dataverse, like what we've set up for faculty to read, um, just in case there's anything in there that might help. That would be super helpful. Thank you so much, Robin. Anyone else have any input into this? Anyone else have a problem they'd like to present? Well, I guess I have a, a question and I don't want to take up too much time, but in talking about the shift to cloud, um, whenever we have costed out uh, significant shifts to AWS in particular, but I think they're all similar, um, it really is not cost effective unless you can count on reducing staffing, like removing labor input. So I'm trying to understand, number one, is that what other people have seen too? Now, noting that our use case is very heavy on storage. Um, and yeah, so is, is that what other people have seen when they cost this out? And also, um, like what are the considerations that that you're like what are you thinking of when moving to cloud like the one that comes to mind for me is if we want to support user provided data with essentially limitless scaling it's basically a requirement but we don't really have that requirement yet so there hasn't been anything forcing us into the cloud and the on-premise system that we have now is very cost effective in comparison so i'm just curious to hear other people's thoughts on that I want to just say something, and this may not even remotely apply to you, but it's what comes to my mind immediately. And that's, and you're in library IT. Um, for us, it was mandated, so which is a non sequitur in terms of the conversation, but it isn't in terms of cost reduction. So it represented a cost reduction for the university, even though it represented absolutely no change in cost and as a matter of fact it probably costs me slightly more in terms of time and energy we use google instead of aws but just the whole the, the way that you manage stuff in in the cloud is uh is different enough from the way we managed it with a university it with a university data center that it actually in some ways, I, I haven't done the analysis, so I'm, this is just off the top of my head, but I think in some ways uh, it may take me longer uh, in the cloud. But I do also think that there was a significant cost reduction at the, at the levels that don't affect me. <laughs> so I don't know if that no, is it, your it's situation a or not. Yeah. Well, it, it makes sense. I, I, just, I just try to understand sort of the higher level executive decision of moving to cloud, because I know that at Berkeley, for instance, our on-premise calls are highly subsidized. So we pay a lot less for the data center. We're not, we're not paying directly for all the power and staffing and everything else. Like that's largely subsidized. So I could see there being an overall reduction in cost to the university, but then possibly an increase in departmental costs as yes. a result of that. Yeah. Yes. Yep. We've been I would guess if I did that analysis, that would be what's happening. So, sorry, Robin, go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. I don't have a full analysis, but I know when we started moving to AWS initially, it looked, you know, more expensive. In our case, central computing was already talking about getting out of the infrastructure business. It'll be a long time before they're there, but they're moving to cloud services. Um, but there were a lot of advantages like, you know, if you're not having to rack the servers and you're not having to buy memory and have things contained, cloud technologies give you a lot of flexibility. 
like you can increase RAM, you can increase storage with, you know, very quickly. And so there's efficiencies to be gained. Um, also in the new way that the software developers are developing code, leveraging those new technologies that are available in the cloud, it's easier, it's more efficient, but it took training, you know, to get there. Um, but I don't think any of our staff would go back now. And there are a lot of different options of storage in the cloud. And so making really, um, making sure that you look at, you know, what you're storing and how much that's gonna cost and how often it needs to be accessed and all of those things need to go into where you store something. Yeah. Obviously, S3 is really expensive. So for our 24 by 7, got to get it quickly stuff. S3 makes sense, but there's a lot of things that people rarely touch that do not go into that. Yeah, I'd say when... <clears throat> When I worked at Georgetown, we we migrated from the the server in the basement of the library, which was <laughs> unstable and prone to air conditioner problems and other things. So then we moved to the university data center that was out in the suburbs. And I mean, to, to me, it was it was fantastic. I think the library was just kind of entrusted to pro provision subsets of resources that we had been given. So as a user of it, I loved it. But then we essentially we were told it was on the whole cheaper for the university to move to the cloud so you know at that level but i i think and i i sort of left as that shift was happening but i know there were the way the chargebacks were going to be handled uh switched and so i have a sense after moving to the cloud people the library may have been paying for more than it had been paying for before with the you know centralized data center yeah, it sounds like a lot of this depends on what you're used to now. Like if you're racking physical units in a closet in the basement or even in the data center, there's a huge benefit to going to cloud. But in our situation, we're actually effectively in an on-premise cloud. We're using VMware on site. Um, so we're not having to go on site to like swap tapes or anything like that. Um, and the other thing I would, I would note is that a lot of the, the tooling around this, so for instance, Terraform is a big one for provisioning cloud resources. A few years ago, the support for on-prem stuff like VMware was very bad, and now it's actually quite good. It's it's almost I wouldn't say it's caught up, but it's closer to having caught up to, you know, AWS or Google provisioners. Do you I would have, say too. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, you can go. Oh, thanks. So, yeah, my question was: Do you, do you have uh, the need to? essentially uh, interface with the cloud from existing systems like a, you know, a dams or something that, you know, will, with regard to the increase in departmental like level costs, um, does this mean that you'll be also reintegrating like a dams with a cloud uh, like API or, and as well, and that's going to be like a major cost for you or? Yeah, so some of that is actually, we use Tind and Tind is storing all of its, its objects in an S3 bucket because that's how their software is configured. And then we actually mirror that back to on-prem. So okay. that cost is baked into just running Tind. But besides that, I mean, there are other use cases where I could see it. And then the integration is not so good if you have some chunk of infrastructure in the cloud and then you're also doing a lot of stuff on-prem with your VMware environment. You have to hand roll a lot of those integrations. So. Okay. I guess one caveat that we had was the cost of the central service. We did have a lot of stuff on VMware and we had some fairly significant downtimes because if you wanted redundancy and you wanted things to be at the level where you didn't suffer downtimes, it was very, very expensive. So there was a new organization that came in and it's, you know, the difference in the cost between cloud and on-prem was not that different when they truly costed out what they would charge us for the kind of uptime we wanted. That's a great point. Thank you.
any other cloud uh, issues, questions, comments? So, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Leah. That's good. Um, Go to the yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I um, am the coordinator for the new Michigan Digital Preservation Network. Um, and we one of the strategies that we're considering is cloud storage um, with Wasabi. Um, our IT person did price out um, multiple levels of AWS storage, um, Backblaze, you know, a whole, a whole host of things. And Wasabi ended up being um, the most cost efficient when you take into consideration um, needing, needing to move files around um, or pull them quickly. And so, um, but one of the things that we're thinking about now is how folks are, how often and how, like what tools you're using or workflows you're using, um, folks are doing fixity checks for the content that's in the cloud. Um, and we've been talking to um, Andrew Diamond at AP Trust because we're using um, Dart as the ingest tool for our workflow right now. Um, and so he's been very helpful, but it's nice to get um, uh, multiple uh, perspectives and, and ideas. So I'm happy to hear more uh, of what y'all are doing or what y'all maybe have heard folks are doing. So um, anything is helpful. <laughs> In terms of fixity, is that what you're asking about Chelsea? Yeah, that would be great. So um, have you, were you able, how long have you been in, uh, as part of NDSA? Because we, um, not to shut down the conversation at all, but um, yeah. we had, we've had a couple of, um, of monthly presentations specifically on fixity in the cloud. Uh, yes, I, I saw the presentation in March. Okay. And then we had another one last February, uh, and that one, um, I talked a little bit about what we're doing with Google, but uh, oh, okay. it's pretty specific to Google. Um, yeah. But the idea of it, so in a nutshell, the, I, the idea was trying to use the, um, the hashes that Google already creates as just part of their process. Mm -hmm. um, I th and, I, and I'm intrigued by Wasabi and I've heard people mention uh, Wasabi and what you're able to do with that. And I don't know anything about it, but I'm, I'm interested in it. But I think overall with Amazon for sure and with uh, Google, um, the way they're doing their storage, their uh, object storage, you really can't do fixity in the way at least we used to do fixity um, in terms of um sort of having a, a file structure that you can then run a process against so the strategy the overall strategy at least with google with what we're doing is um using big query to query the data that's already being created as part of google's process and then reporting on that and sort of using that as data to do sort of uh, comparisons and things like that, uh, rather than having the notion be that I go in and I run fixity against mm -hmm. uh, a certain data set. So mm -hmm. it's a different, it's a, it's a mind shift in terms of what, uh, and I think it's also uh, an impetus to think about how often you need to check fixity. I know we yeah. were checking it a lot before we moved to Google um, and and basically really had very few, if any, um, issues that came up. So I think that's that's part of the equation when you've got to change your whole strategy around fixity is thinking about how often that happens. And also because the cloud providers, at least Google and Amazon, like I said, I'm not as sure about Wasabi, but uh, they do automatic, um, they, they, when they find an issue, it automatically corrects it. So it's, 
it's less about finding mistakes that have to be fixed and more about present uh, about creating an audit trail so that you can show what has happened over time. But uh, theoretically, if you have something in Google, if we have something in Google and there's bit rot for some reason, that document will be have already been reverted to the last good copy before I even see any kind of uh, data that tells me that. But right. using Google's data, I can at least get that and say this happened, you know, th that that this mm -hmm. this was corrected. So it, it really is just just a different mindset around fixity, I think, uh, hmm. when you're working with the cloud, cloud storage providers. Although again, I don't know about Wasabi. So <laughs> And I'll say for the, the merit system, we, we do go through and fix it each check. Um, we've got a 120 million files and we fix it each check, you know, like two to six million a day. We've been tuning that. So we're, we're really attuned to our numbers recently because we've, we've made some uh, optimizations and we, um, we're now using three providers that are S3 compatible. So we've got Amazon, we have Wasabi and we have um, the Cumulo storage from uh, the San Diego Supercomputer Center, and we uh, go through and you know pull the files down and actually compute uh, yeah. checksums for each of those. And then for Glacier Storage, we really just check the metadata to see that the content's there, but we don't actually pull content out of Glacier and fix it. Yeah, each that I should have I should have said that that it, it's not that you can't do it. We can't afford to to pull the files and and do the fixity checking. So that definitely is a possibility if you can afford. The, the retrieval costs from Amazon or Google, whatever. Right, so, and that's so. and that's actually why we chose Wasabi over Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. You know, thinking thinking about pulling the files to do those fixity checks um, right. ahead of time. Um, yep. So hopefully that'll yep. that'll show up in the in the cost that we calculated or that the RIT person did. Yeah. Um, sorry, Terry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh no, no, that's just quick summary of what we do. Mm. Is Wasabi still single zone? Do they have replication now? Um, that would be a question for our IT person. <laughs> um, I don't know off the top of my head. Can you tell me again um, where where you are so I can get it in the minutes? Oh, sure. I'm at the Michigan Digital Preservation Network. Michigan Digital Preservation Network. Okay, great. Yeah, Thank we're you. not a real preservation network. We're just a, an IMLS grant project still, um, ah, so, got it. but thinking about being real. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a real boy someday. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, Chelsea, when you talked to Andrew Diamond, did he talk about AP Trust investigating Wasabi? Yes, he did. Okay. Um, he, I've actually been meeting pretty regularly with um, Bradley Daigle. Um, okay. Uh, just tied in with other other folks. Uh, I'm I meet monthly with the Dipsig group because Cinda May, who you know was with Indie Press, kind of pulled me in. Um, and so yeah, we've been having some really great conversations with them. Good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. One one last bit to to mention there is I, I know um, when we originally looked into Wasabi. Um, there, there was the uh, added benefit of them running every 90 days fixity checks um, on, on any of the content that you have in their cloud. And um, I assume you've, you've probably heard that as well. You know, I didn't. That would be a, a huge bonus for us, though, um, if it's something that we don't have to um, to handle ourselves because I am, you know, because we are in our grant period and I am a staff of one. Um, and the, my IT person when I can get um, some extra time from her. Um, but yeah, anything that, that makes uh, things a little bit easier and takes things off of my shoulders, um, I'll, I'll reach out to them and ask. Okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, um, it's something that they've, they've talked about that I know they do, but um, in terms of actually, on, to Leah's point, um, in terms of actually obtaining the results of those fixie checks 
through yeah. some other programmatic interface. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how that works or if that works. Um, so yeah, but that's basically, you know, thinking about it differently, just like Leah said. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I imagine that 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 data does not come out of the black box very easily. So right, right, yeah. <laughs> but hopefully, it's there. <laughs> right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're we're getting uh, we're about ten of uh, ten of one. So, um, do folks have other any other challenges or issues they want to bring up? I know you had a couple, Eric. You want to take a stab at those, at one of those or both of those? Sure. Um, yeah, one of them is is really more of a, a curiosity than uh, an existing issue right now. Um, but I, I think it's uh, an interesting one. Um, so over the past uh, year, we had a digital preservation strategy working group at UC uh, that was responsible for actually trying to enumerate the the content that was being that is being preserved uh, either through our merit system or uh, through Chronopolis or otherwise um, across all the campuses in the UC and so we had the challenge of basically you know going to each of the campuses uh, applying a sort of taxonomy to the different kind you know mind types and types of content um, and and coming back with numbers um so from from that um effort uh as i just mentioned came this this high level taxonomy um of file types and content types uh and that got me really interested in in the notion of well how can we <clears throat> it is it valuable to dive a little deeper into that and say um from the perspective of collecting policies at the individual campus libraries, um, you know, how can you, how can you dive in and say, well, your collecting policies are actually doing what you want them to do because we can examine or data mine uh, the content that's being preserved. Um, maybe that means, you know, going through all the, the textual content and the, the metadata files that are being preserved uh, and, and extracting concepts. Uh, so we know that, uh, you know, overall, even though maybe, uh, you know, any one particular group on campus might have access to only one or two collections, but uh, you need a higher level view of, of you know, what's what's in those collections. Um, so, so from from that, from that standpoint, I'm, you know, it, it's a it's been a curiosity of mine, if, if it's feasible to introduce some sort of data mining or machine learning when it comes to content that's being preserved, not necessarily content that's, you know, fully accessible in the library, um, but just, you know, again, like focusing on what's being preserved and finding out whether or not your collecting policies are resulting in preserving what you want to do uh, or preserving what you want to have preserved. So um, I'm, I'm yeah, I kind of to kind of put that out there. I don't know if anybody has ever engaged in some sort of machine learning to to mine what type of, you know, um, you know what's in all the collections and preservation repository that they that they're using at the, at any given time, and if that's valuable. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of a, a big general question, but it would definitely if we if we could do something like that at least for we have an enormous amount of textual content but also obviously image content um you know it, it, it's a that would be a huge undertaking introducing any kind of machine learning um and then you know with it comes the build by decision and um you know what kind of value is there for the libraries themselves is the main question so but Sorry about the background noise here. So from, um, yeah, I, I guess, um, has anyone had uh, 
the opportunity to to you know ask that question or find out if it's valuable to folks to actually have more information about you know at a very granular level like what's in any given collection that's being preserved this is definitely a question for uh you know uh, a mega institution which of course you know with what you're dealing with you guys are a mega institution across all uc campuses for me i I know what's there because there's not so much there that I can't keep track of it. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a good point because it's, um, <clears throat> I mean, in asking that, just bringing up that topic a little bit across the people who are in that working group, there's not a whole lot of interest in the individual campuses knowing what they're, you know, working on uh, in terms of preservation. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I also wonder how much how many individual units on the campuses are kind of siloed and um, from, uh, uh, you know, the next level up of management from that perspective, you know, is it valuable for them to understand what's in what, what content is in that in a given uh, collection or anything like that. So, yeah. Um, hmm. Be refreshing if at the higher levels, this was something that they were concerned about. You know, <laughs> which right, is a cynical, right. cynical statement to make, but in so many institutions, just fighting for attention uh, is can be overwhelming. So. Right, that that and resources. I mean, you know, resources are slim, and yeah, you just right, right, absolutely. Clarifying question. So you said extracting concepts. What do you mean by concepts? Um, what I yeah, what I mean by that is um, <clears throat> uh, having ma a machine learning system that will go in and, and be able to, uh, to do some concept ex extraction, meaning not um, not uh, just search terms or like atomized like single word type things, um, but being able to uh, to actually create uh, yeah the facility to to bring up. Uh, you know, multi-word concepts from textual content. Um, so it's it's actually uh, at my at my last job when I was at Floss uh, a while ago, um, we ended up trying to do exactly that with the entire corpus of like published research articles, um, and ended up working with another organization uh, to give them like you know a snapshot of the corpus and then a snapshot of of what we thought all these you know. Uh, typical subject areas for specific articles were, and then seeing how they could balance out the two by automatically like pulling out either concepts or subject areas from from that textual content, and then you know up leveling that basically making that available. Uh, so yeah, it's um, it it just becomes much more valuable to to actually be able to see what search the different. Uh, concepts or, or subject areas that way with a little bit more context. Um, all right, well, like I said, it's a big general question. Thanks for thanks for chatting about it for a little bit. You, you, you may have to do it yourself, Eric. You may have a big yeah, research right. <laughs> project there for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, well, there's there's now a you know a group that kind of spun off from that that uh, strategy working group and um, yeah so we're we're going to be continuing to meet and yeah should be interesting to get some more feedback on. Well, look look forward to a, a sort of demonstration of a prototype in a in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, some some sometime way down the road. <laughs> right. Okay, well, we're um, we're pretty much uh, close to the hour, um, and yeah, if uh, do, does anybody have anything else they'd like to to add in the last couple of minutes, or Leah, do you want to talk about um, our next meeting or anything? Or... Yep. So in June, uh, Linda Tadic is going to come and talk to us about the um, environmental impact of digital preservation. It's something she. Uh, is fairly passionate about. So uh, I think that will be a really interesting discussion. 
about what it, what the environmental uh, costs are for various options of digital preservation. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. Okay. Any last um, minute, anything, questions, oh yeah. anything? Hmm? Okay. Well, Eric, unless you have anything else, I think we're good to go. Yeah, okay. I'm all set. So, well, yeah. thanks. thanks. Thanks everyone everybody. for, yeah, definitely. We'll thanks see you next all. month. Everybody. Good to see Bye. you all. Thanks everybody.